Hello, I'm Mia Sines, and welcome to Supreme Feminine Essence, The Gifts You Were Born With. My guest this segment is Rebecca Egger. She's a freedom activator and passion priestess. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Mia. And you look so lovely. Thank you. So do you. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca is in a remote part of Mexico right now and for a few years, but you can still reach her after this segment. Our, our credits will be on in the end. But I'm stating this because I want you to understand how amazing it is to have her. And if there's any glitches, it's because it's in a remote part of Mexico. But she uh, works with clients on Skype just like I do, so it's very cool. All right, so share your story with us, honey, from way back. It's, it's a rich one. I've interviewed you before. So I guess, how did I get to the mountains of southern Mexico? Yes. <laughs> um, well, Mia, you know, it started really with a personal tragedy in my life, which was that I lost my mother through the murder. And we were getting ready to go to trial uh, regarding the murder in 2009. And I started having this amazing vision of this lava-like substance bursting through my through a through a pie crust looking substance and landing in my fingers as a feather and I didn't understand what it meant at all until someone said to me oh the feather of Mahat and I thought I looked up Mahat and she was truth justice and cosmic consciousness and I thought oh Mahat has come to comfort me and to tell me that justice will be served and you know, I just kept imagining this lava bursting through the pie crust and the feather, and it comforted me all the time. And then about a week before trial, the the district attorney dropped all of the charges in the murder case, and so we never ended up going to trial. But in the meantime, I had gone to Maine and encountered the high priestess of the Temple of Mahat, and she had begun to work with me to release the grief and to understand Mahat better in the aftermath of all of this. Mm -hmm. So then I decided to take Mahat's name that year uh, at the New Year, which had been my practice to take the name of a different goddess to incorporate the skills that I wanted to receive from that particular goddess. So that year I chose Mahat. Mm -hmm. And... I was standing in this restroom, you know, at this posh resort in Cancun, Mexico, on vacation, my first trip to Mexico, and I had this vision where I saw myself as a woman, suddenly, I saw this, this socially constructed self fall away for a moment, and I could see a whole person. And then I had this voice come into my head, and believe me, Mia, hearing voices is not my bag of tricks. I would kind of wish it was, right? It would be so great if I could just have clear direction spoken straight to me. Yes. But I heard clear as day a voice say to me, he is near. And this was about two days after I had done a ceremony to take Mahat's name. And then a couple of days later, on New Year's Eve, I walked into a bar in Tulum and looked across the room and locked eyes with a Mexican man, who I later learned was connected to the Zapatista rebels in southern Mexico. The Zapatistas are all about truth, justice, and cosmic consciousness. And when I began to read about the Zapatista movement after this encounter, all of a sudden my life and the context of my life began to make sense. At that time, I was a corporate tax director at a multinational corporation. Uh, so it was like the collision of two worlds. Mm -hmm. And I started making trips to Chiapas. I, I left out the best part, the juicy part. Yeah. I, ended up making love, I ended up making love on the beach with this beautiful man on New Year's Eve um, under the full moon. And he was the one who began to tell me the story about the Zapatistas. So I went home and I just started consuming everything I could get my hands on about this movement. And by April, I was on a plane to Villahermosa, which is in Tabasco State, north of here. I didn't even know there was an airport here. That's how little I knew, right? There's an airport an hour away. So I did it the hard way. I landed in Tabasco and took a bus seven hours south. Oh, wow. Through the mountains. You know, we went for, I went from the jungle up into the mountains. And along the way, I could see the indigenous women in their traditional dress, and I went from this very modern oil city, from this very posh hotel that I chose there, into this very rugged, different, completely different environment. Mm -hmm. 
and wound up in San Cristobal and ended up going in search of the rebels uh, and in search of the guy who I needed to help me with all of this. Um, and I ended up actually going to rebel territory and meeting the Zapatista Good Government Board. But by the time I got in to see them, this is the sort of funny part of the story, I thought when I was go- when I set all this up that I, as a you know educated, highly skilled lawyer, had something to offer these indigenous rebels. Well, the moment that I set foot inside rebel territory, I just started to cry mm. because I suddenly realized that I didn't even understand my own predicament well enough to resolve it, much less have something to offer them. So. I managed to get in to see the good government board, but all I could do was cry. (laughs) (laughs) You poor thing. (laughs) So it was like the most embarrassing moment of my life, right? And they and they didn't they didn't really even even say anything much to the crazy crying gringo with nothing much to offer, right? Right. And all I could get out was something about how they had changed my life, (laughs) and it was over. Uh huh. But the way that they really changed my life is through their example, because I had a lot of trauma in my life, ending with really the loss of my mother under such tragic circumstances. And what I learned from this movement is really Mm self-love. I learned from this movement, from these Mayan indigenous rebels who had been spat upon their entire lives for generations, they rose up and they, they were able to make enough contact with their own inner goodness, their own essential goodness, that they were able to stand up and take territory and create a whole new way of existing for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the example that I took to heart more than the dramatic moments of sobbing in front of (laughs) us. And I love that you uh, express that and share that with the world. (laughs) It's beautiful. Thank you. It's wonderful. And from all of this, your journey has been about um, facing these fears and the, the things that we're born and raised with are things that come into our experience and turning them into um, healing and light, although you'd work with a lot of darkness, correct? Well, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure I would put it that way. I think I started off as what you might call a, a light worker. Mm-hmm. I'm a Reiki master, and so the way that I have always seen Reiki Mm -hmm. is as light energy moving through my hands. Mm -hmm. I I have had some experiences in the last year or so that have really changed my relationship to darkness, and that's really what I want to offer today. I want to transform your relationship to darkness. I want to transform our listeners' relationship to darkness. Mm -hmm. There's a place for light and there's a place for darkness, and I feel like it's extremely important that we take a, a serious look at how we how we relate to the darkness. As women, I think it's very important that we take this journey of, of transforming our relationship to the darkness. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I'm also a Reiki master, and um, I love the fact that the energy, when you when you do take on that beautiful, if it calls you that form of energy healing, I love how it totally does move through not just your hands, but your whole being, your whole body, your whole essence is connected to such a higher vibration that it's remarkable. It truly is. Okay, wonderful. So let's talk about the darkness of the universe and the seats and seeds of all the light. Yeah, so in order for us to do this little exercise, we really have to get out of our Earth perspective, right? And, and I want to say, I'm sure she's going to make me do it because she's done that before to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we're in Earth perspective, Mia, like, we're surrounded by light half of the day, at least, you know, roughly half the day, and on certain days of the year, we're ha- half light and half darkness. So we have this perspective of light and darkness and balance. Yet we still sort of approach the darkness as though it were the place of evil. And if you were, if you back up, if you just sort of allow yourself to leave Earth and back up into the atmosphere and go out into the universe, this is not the relationship at all. In fact, as a matter of science, the universe is only 4% planets, stars, and people. 
So, or at least that we know of, right? The people that we know of, right. um, and the un the known universe. So, four percent planets and stars. So then you write that down further, and really the universe is some tiny percentage of light. Mm -hmm. And the universe started in darkness, and then the stars began to come on. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the universe, the other ninety six percent, is a combination of what scientists call dark matter. Mm -hmm and dark energy, and we don't even know what it is. It's a mystery. Mm -hmm. So light comes from stars, and stars are finite. They, 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 they are born when the dust and the particles that are the seeds that are floating in the darkness mm -hmm. kind of have a disturbance, to put it in like the best layman's terms I can right. come up with. And they begin to collapse into a core, and eventually you get this nuclear fusion that happens. And that's how the star begins. But stars really only last a few billion years. To us, it seems infinite. Right. But to the universe, stars have an infant, have, an, have a finite life. They burn out, or they fade away, or they go supernova. And they literally go from dust to dust, mm -hmm. just the way that we do. And we're also <laughs> born in darkness. Absolutely. We're created in darkness as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Created in the womb darkness mm -hmm. of our mothers. Right. And I want to talk about that, too, as we talk about the feminine essence. Mm -hmm. I just want to add one last thing about dark, about dark matter and dark energy. So the universe is expanding, and it's accelerating in its expansion. And scientists have said that the thing responsible for expanding this entire universe is dark energy, which is about 70% of the universe. And again, we don't know what it is or really even understand how it works. We just know that it must be there. Mm -hmm. So... I guess what I'm saying is don't diss the darkness because it's big and it's powerful and it's responsible for a huge process in our universe. Well, let's take that to a spiritual level, um, more so. We wouldn't diss it because we don't know in our souls and our human body, we don't know everything, but yet we do know that there's so much beauty out there that we only have a glimpse at, right? I mean, in our when we get into a spiritual realm, there's, we only have a glimpse of the beauty. And what you're talking about is, as that dark matter can have so much beauty in it that we don't even know. So to appreciate and accept the darkness within ourselves as well as the light is that beauty that comes together. I love that you, that you, you know, put those together like that. It's, it's lovely. It really is. Thank you. And to, to build on that, like if you really look at it, how would you ever see the beauty of the stars that are shining? You know, you've seen those cosmos photos, like, that show you various different stars, and there are these bursts of color and light that are happening. The nebula! I love it. Backdrop of darkness. Yeah. It's an amazing, like, if, if everything was light, you wouldn't be able to see any of that. Right. Interesting, huh? So, the things we hide away in the darkness. What's that about? Well, that's that's about us, really. Mm -hmm. Like, what happens to people like me, and I, I think, like, I, I'm not speaking out of turn to say to people like you, mm -hmm. who've had trauma in our lives and who've overcome right. a lot, is that because of the traumas we suffered, we put parts of ourselves away. We hide them away because we think, oh, that part of me was responsible for what happened or that part of me was violated in what happened. Or we don't think about it at all, and we just put those things aside. We put our originality away. We put our power away in many instances because of the things that have happened to us. And so when we have the courage to go into our darkness and to go in and, and retrieve those things and to bring them out to the world and to let them shine, we're really bringing our essential self to the surface. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think we most essentially leave behind is we leave behind our primal instincts. We tuck those away in the darkness and we leave them to the lions and the tigers and we try to think of ourselves as being beyond that. Mm -hmm. But it's not really true. And I think as women, we give away a huge amount of our power when we give away that primal urge. And I'm going to say it really bold. We give away that primal urge to kill, right? That protective energy. 
And we, we mistake passivity for nonviolence. But really nonviolence <coughs> or weakness or weakness. Or weakness. Mm -hmm. And true nonviolence is a warrior's path. Well, you better not get out there and stand in front of the tanks in Tiananmen Square if you don't have a contact with your primal instincts. So I tell you, those people... <coughs> I'm so sorry. I tell you, those people... Those people who were standing in Tiananmen Square, they knew what was happening for them. They were in touch with those primal instincts, and they made choices. And so if there's really anything I could say about violence and nonviolence and the urge to kill and the primal instincts is that they met, this all must be harnessed in a tactical fashion so that we take those primal instincts, those, those, those intuitions and those gut feelings and even the darkest, darkest urges that we have, and we listen to them. We don't necessarily act on them. We choose when, when we want the tactical deployment of violence, when it serves in self-defense, for instance, and we choose when we want nonviolence, but all, all of it we choose tactically in order to move our lives in the direction that we want them to go. And so this is one of the things that we retrieve from the darkness, is our primal instincts. And to get in touch and keep that in balance is, is primary, isn't it? Because it allows, it allows us to make those decisions if they're good or bad if they're good or, or beneficial, as opposed mm -hmm. to harmful. Wonderful. Meeting with the Dark Goddess. Ah, the meeting with the Dark Goddess. That's the moment when the duality breaks down between light and darkness. That's the moment that brings us in contact with our deep originality, and with our power, and with our primal urges, because the dark goddess comes into our lives in the form of crisis. She comes into our lives in the form of anguish, loss, oftentimes. And all of a sudden, the niceties, the sort of prison of niceness breaks down in us, and we become more serious about who we are and what we have to offer the world. If we live through the meeting with the dark goddess, we come out of it as powerful individuals, mm -hmm. aligned with our purpose, aligned with our desire, mm -hmm. we, we, we have a transformative experience with her. Like, I want to come back to Mahat. I feel like this is really, really important. Okay. Mahat is a death goddess, as much as she is truth, justice, and cosmic consciousness. You know, she's the goddess that, that you know, the, the, the feather, her feather of truth, the one that was landing in my hands, mm -hmm is placed on her scales, and if your heart upon death is lighter than the feather, then you pass on to paradise. Yeah. If not, your heart is fed to uh, Amit, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, but Amit, which is the goddess or the soul eater. She's almost like a demonette. This is scary. <laughs> about what this means, yes, right? Let's. It sounds very, it sounds very similar to um, hellfire and damnation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from from the back, from the Christian background, and 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 it it does sound scary on the surface, but you know when I relate to this story, once once the soul is eaten, once the heart is eaten, once the essence is eaten by Amit, it's released into restlessness, and so I have to say, what does restlessness mean, really? Mm -hmm. What is this transformation of energy that's taking place? Because energy is really never destroyed. So it's the movement of this energy from embodiment to restlessness. And that means that the expression of the energy that was embodied in life is showing up in this after afterlife moment. And this restlessness is really about what didn't happen during life. It's about what we didn't bring to fruition, what we didn't ground in our lives, what we, what can the community that we didn't fulfill, the the meaning of justice that we failed to embody, is expressed in death in our restlessness. And if we did embody those things, our heart is light, mm -hmm. our community has been light, mm -hmm. and I mean light as in weightless in a sense, um, free of burden. Right. Yeah. So he when we healed, healed, healed mm -hmm. is a good way of putting it. Yes, absolutely. So when we meet the dark goddess, if we come out the other side, 
we have this exacting standard in us of the scales and the feather, and suddenly we're measuring everything against our potential and our desires. We become very serious about what we have to offer the world. I mean, we've all known, particularly women who've gone through some sort of crisis, and this woman who was formerly meek and, you know, busy caring for her family, is suddenly a lion roaring, and she's going to have what she's going to have, and the marriage falls apart, and everything gets reordered around this new priority of self and her gifts. Mm -hmm. Self-love, self-devotion comes out of the meeting with the dark goddess. There's which, no more fooling around. <laughs> which is important to face because otherwise you just go into survival mode rather than the healing mode that you're talking about. And it's so important to get to that side of the self-discovery, the self-love, the nurturing and many listeners might have depression and not know how to get out of it and it's of course depression is brought on, brought on by a few different situations but um, it's really important to understand what you're talking about because there is a way out there absolutely is a way out so thank you I want to well, I, I think depression is like a sign that you're in the sweet spot <clears throat> really if you listen to your depression it's telling you what's wrong yeah. Then the next most important step is to is to take the step to heal yourself and to get out of it. A lot of people stay within the depression and can't move forward. So wonderful. Now we're we're getting um, along here in time, and I want to talk about your book, which is also da 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 your free gift, right? Yes, that's yes. my free. So right. my book is called Coming Alive. And it's a book about spirituality, activism, and living passionately in the age of global domination. And I think what I want to say about the book is continuing on with our discussion of darkness is that when we refuse the meeting with the dark goddess, we get the kind of world that we live in now. Because the dark goddess comes along to tear apart our veneer of control. She comes along to introduce us to the chaos and teach us to manage it with the kind of order that brings things to fruition, not the kind of order that imposes itself on people and on situations. She brings us in deep contact with ourselves, but from that deep contact with ourselves springs also a deep commitment, I think, to the, to the embodied life that we have here on Earth. And when we're in a deeply committed place about the life that we're living here on Earth, when we're really embodying that, we don't let the planet fall apart around us. We don't, we don't let water be polluted and our food sources destroyed. The people who will rise up and demand a different way of being on this planet are the people who touched the dark goddess and accepted her lessons and come into this power that I'm talking about come into this self-direction, come into the self-love, because then they begin, to de they begin to demand the infrastructure that supports the unfolding of our human potential for themselves and for the, com for the community. Mm -hmm. And they create new kinds of community that are supportive of the fulfillment of their potential and the potential of those who are around them. Wonderful. It's a radical transformation that, that's possible. Is your, um, is your story, um, I can't recall, and I've interviewed you before about your book, is your story, um, that's when you do so many interviews, <laughs> um, when your story, is your personal story within the book as well? It's in the book, but the book is not a memoir. Right. I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training, so I kind of lawyered it, you know. I, I pulled together, together all these different sources that throughout my life that helped right. me address my traumas and... You know, I had this moment when Edward Snowden came forward, when I was like, okay, the domination thing that I've been trying to get away from my whole life right. is I universal. Now, yeah. yeah. So I sat down with Buddhism and Christian seers and, you know, um, pagan mythology and psychology, and I did economic analysis. I drew on books that were talking about new kinds of capitalism. I included... Um, commentary on violent versus nonviolent resistance. I looked at Martin Luther King Jr. I looked at the Zapatista movement and I brought all of this together into what really is a three-part journey. Mm -hmm. Through 
we exit or die to the domination system that we're living in. And I have to acknowledge domination system is not my original term. I've cited in the book where that came from. There's an author named Walter Wink. that it, That's his term. But it's a very convenient way to talk about the system we're living in. So we die to this domination system. We construct a new mythology. We rise into that mythology. And then we begin to live by it. We begin to create our lives around it. When we have our encounter with the dark goddess, and we come up with her inside of us, rooted in darkness, moving forward with the things that we're bringing to the world, things that we're bringing to the light, the light that we may be channeling into the world. Wonderful. And I apologize. I read almost a book a week since I interview almost an author every week. Um, so I apologize. I did read, as you start talking about I'm like, yes, I remember now. <laughs> So, so wonderful. We are um, just about out of time, but I'd like to have you share some last thoughts with us, and maybe we can elaborate on a little on them a little bit more. What's coming to your heart to share with the viewers? Well, I guess what I want to say is, you know, I'm rooted in darkness. Mm -hmm. I'm rooted in my feminine creative power, that chaos of potential that I hold in my womb that's present in, in earth, that we walk on, the place where seeds germinate. Um, but I'm really more red. <laughs> I really, I think that's what, that's what comes out of this meeting with the dark goddess, this, in, this incorporation of the darkness, is that you then become all about your passion. Mm -hmm. I'm the life force moving. I'm the red, passionate direction that, that comes out of this this deep, heavy, dark, like you said, kind of scary work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the end result of this journey is this bright, red, passionate place. Mm -hmm. The um, scary place, we all have to go through it in order to get to the other side. And that's the beauty of our own personal journey. And is one experience or one episode of, of getting in touch with ourself, getting into the darkness, is that it? No. It comes and goes throughout our whole human lifetime to help us grow more and further and deeper. And not every growth spurt, I'm sure you'll agree to, is brought on by darkness. A lot of it is brought no. on by light, which is the other side of the darkness. Right? Well, I think I was seduced by the light, right? I, when I first started coming to Chiapas, I was beset by fear, because in American culture we have this dread fear of what's happening in Mexico. And so for me, I was walking into the heart of danger. Of course, that's not my everyday life here, right? Or else I wouldn't live here. But I had to confront this wall of fear, and I kept seeing a light opening up over Chiapas. <laughs> yeah, right, that, right about that. <laughs> the light drew me into this journey into the darkness that... It took years, years of, of being in the underworld, so to speak, of being in the muck and the mud mm -hmm. to finally come out the other side and into this redness. Mm -hmm. So it's really the unity of the three goddesses, I think, for me. Mm -hmm. The light, the dark, and the red. The birth, the death, and, and the life. Mm -hmm. The birth, the death, and the rebirth, you know. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us for this segment. And our, as I mentioned before in the beginning, our credits are at the end. Thank it was you. a pleasure to have you on. And we'll see you all in the next segment. Thank you for joining us. Bye.